Welcome back, and thanks for tuning in to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show, where today we're revisiting a gem from 2023. It's an episode that pushed us right to the top of the podcast charts. Joining us for what turned out to be a masterclass on neuroscience and the employee experience was none other than the father of neuromanagement, Paul Zak. Paul helped us decode the mysteries of the human brain and its impact on leadership and the workplace. Whether you're a seasoned leader, an aspiring manager, or just a curious mind, get ready for this fascinating journey into the world of neuroscience, where every thought leads to innovation. Buckle up, folks. It's time to challenge the status quo with science. The war for talent is over, right? Talent has won because we have record low unemployment rates. There are no more babies, right? We've got to actually create workplaces where people can really be satisfied, have a sense of accomplishment, professional growth, personal growth. All this is really important, particularly for younger people, but for everybody. So I think part of that is we're going to see this employment move to the workplaces that have better cultures. And then the next question below that, the neuroscience question is, what does a great culture look like? Welcome back, everyone, to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on all around us and explore the disruptive convergence of technology, business, and people. Here are your hosts, Ira Wolf and Jason Cochran. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. I'm Ira Wolf. And I'm Jason Cochran. If you think this is just another podcast, think again. We're the voice of the most important conversations on the future of work that's confronting business leaders and people today. Our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the ever-changing convergence of business, technology, and people. Hey, Jason. On today's show, we are truly going to live up to our show's title, Geek Skeezers and Googleization. There's a a geezer I know personally pretty well. He's going to, who's geeking out about how neuroscience is transforming leadership and management in the workplace. But for all of you, don't hit pause or swipe left quite yet, because we're really talking about how to make every day the best day ever for your employees. So imagine just for a minute that Tina Turner was your CEO and the style that only Tina could do, she bellows out her classic, what's love got to do with it? But this time, she she switches it up a bit and asks, what's trust got to do with it? Because this is only after your CHRO, with the best of intentions, suggests that what your company needs to do is build a culture of love and trust. And that, for sure, will fix the latest round of embarrassing and disappointingly low employee engagement scores. Well, guess what, folks? Trust and love have everything to do with it. But before your mind start wandering off to those cringy office romances that had everyone gossiping at the water cooler when we used to go into the office, we're not talking today about turning your office into a sequel of The Bachelor. Instead, our guest today, neuroscientist rock star Paul Zak, is here to introduce us to a concept called immersion. And if you think you've heard science turning into reality stuff before, strap in because this is like showing your grandparents who are still using a rotary phone, who may still be using a rotary phone and landline, your brand new iPhone Pro Max Titanium 15. Yep, after today, you might want to rethink how you measure employee engagement, employee experience, and more importantly, how you create it. So the cherry on top is Paul isn't just spitting out theories from his armchair. Paul is armed with 20 years of hardcore research, data, and science that doesn't just explain, but predicts employee happiness, joy, loyalty, and productivity. So grab your notepad, and I guess on this Googleization show, it might be your smart tablet, position those earbuds and get prepared to have your management world rock. But before we jump into our perfect labor storm segment and bring Paul on, I wanted to take just a minute to acknowledge that both Jason and I were this week awarded the prestigious Top Voice in 2023 award by Thinkers360. 
The Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show is one big force behind that award. And we thank you, Googleization Nation, from the bottom of our hearts for helping us consistently crack the top 100 podcasts for leadership and management. Now, let's jump into the perfect labor storm where we focus each week on a disruptive, surprising, or worrisome trend that we believe you should know. And this week, we're going to feature a few stats from our guest, Paul Zach's research. Comparing people at low trust companies with people at high trust companies, the people at high trust companies experience, get this, 74% less stress. We've been talking a ton about that. 106% more energy, 50% more prior, higher productivity, 13% fewer workdays, 76% more engagement, 29% more satisfaction with their lives, and 40% less burnout. But it's not just Paul who's saying this. A recent study at MIT revealed that trusting employees are 260% more motivated to work. They have 41% lower rates of absenteeism, absenteeism and are 50% less likely to look for another job. Now, at the same time, most employers overestimate their workforce trust level by almost 40%. So apparently, it's that building a trust culture and spreading a little love around doesn't work. That's the rumor being spread in the boardroom. But how we've been trying to do it definitely needs to change. Absolutely, Iron. I can't wait to hear what uh, what we hear today from Paul on this, on how we do it. I can tell you a little bit from my experience. Um, as, as you well know, I've kind of been getting immersed in, in a new work environment as I joined the team at Human Works 8 on August 14th. And it's been incredible. And I'll tell you, one of the most helpful things that the team has done for me so far is they've helped to understand me cognitively, effectively, and also conatively. In other words, they're trying to understand those three parts of my mind, how I think, how I feel, and how I tend to go about doing things uh, just naturally or instinctively. And this has helped me focus my best energy and, and get aligned to the tasks where it's a great match and where I can deliver value. And without them taking that interest and in getting to know me on that deep of a level on those three parts of my mind, it wouldn't have gone as smoothly so far as what it has. And it seems like for far too long, that we've come at connecting people and work from the wrong angle as we've kind of looked myopically through strictly the job lens and then looking at the rote hard skills that a person has without considering the rest of their neurological thumbprint and the alignment with the task to be done and how that functions within a team. And so I'm really excited that we've got a neuroscience expert in Paul Zach today that's gonna help us set the record straight and rethink how we're integrating people and work. So without further ado, let's stop talking about him and actually bring him on and learn from him today. Googleization Nation, let's give a warm welcome to Paul Zak. I, I couldn't resist Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and did you know that I was on The Bachelor? I did not. Well, if uh, people Google me and The Bachelor, they'll find I was a uh, science expert on The Bachelor. So it's all about love and trust and connection are very similar in the brain. So when we study one, we understand a lot about the other. So I guess that's called synchrony, right? Or right. serendipity, one of the two, <laughs> or just dumb luck, <laughs> if there's such a thing. So, uh, Paul, there is so much to talk about. I wasn't kidding, kind of geeking out about this. Um, as you know, we, we, we talked a few weeks ago. And, uh, I, you know, I've always, in, you know, appreciated the science of neuroscience. So I took a deep dive this summer, uh, took a six week certificate course. And um, that's how I got introduced to you and, and, and met you through that. Um, let's but I, I know there's a lot of people that just don't get it because even I I'm I'm, I'm amazed at how much neuro and I put this in quotes neuroscience is in our lives today um and you you've done tremendous work so it, with, with you know even commercials i mean all branding and marketing and and, and things that we do um and we're going to dig into how this relates to employee experience and culture and in the workplace um but kind of what's it, what's your simplest 
definition of neuroscience for people that are out that are listening for our audience? Well, let me go back one step and say why neuroscience. So neuroscience is measuring brain activity while do, doing tasks. And the whole reason for that is because I'm a super lazy person. Uh, I don't want to guess about some perhaps debunked psychological theory on why people do whatever. I would actually measure where that comes from, which is not the elbow or the knee, it's the brain. So if we can measure brain activity, we can ask, oh, what happens when people are passionate about their work? What happens when they provide extraordinary customer experience? Um, what happens to an ad that uh, sells a lot of product, right? So I really want to understand that so then we can reverse engineer the process and actually create those um, opportunities for that brain activity to uh, flourish. And then it gets to measurement, right? So once I know the brain systems, then if I can find a way to measure that, particularly measure it in real time, make it easy, then I can have an objective measure on whether the culture I've created at my work is working or not, whether the marketing is working, whether the uh, training is working for my employees. But what what you've been doing, and, and certainly been successful at it, and it, it's a journey, so you've got a long way to go yet, uh, it is as I often talk about is, is that science is turned into reality. Science fiction is turned into reality. Uh, and so these are things that um, it, it's not that you have to hire a $500,000 neuroscientist to come in and set up a research lab and you get all, you know, it takes years and years. I mean, we're talking real time data. I mean, just like you go out and you take a walk and you can check your, your, your pulse and your heart rate and your fitness and you get that. But the the one thing and, and again bringing this to you know back to our work talking about the workplace is is it fair to say that neuroscience is disrupting everything we knew about how we measured and approached employee engagement and and i say that because i don't think there's a day that goes by that i don't listen to a podcast read an article i often cite it myself um hear something about gallup's engagement survey. Mm -hmm. They've been doing it for 40 years. They've been studying people. They've been asking people, you know, how they feel about work. And so I think it was in the first two or three chapters uh, of your book, Immersion, which we'll, we'll bring up here. Um, you, you sort of, in my mind, shattered. It's like, we're, we're just not, we're, we're getting what they think they feel, but not actually how engaged they are. Am I on the right path? Am I correct? Exactly right. So if, if I ask you, Ira, you know, how much you're enjoying this conversation right now, uh, you know, from one to seven, I, I don't know, compared to what, right? Where there's, there's no basis for that, number one. And number two, I'm asking about your underlying emotional state, which is largely driven by unconscious processes in the brain that are not made conscious. So if, you, if I force you to give me a number, you will. Now, if that number predicted movie ticket sales and advertising sales bumps from, you know, sales bumps from advertising and, and um, employee productivity, good to go. We, you know, we don't have to do research for the last hundred years, but you're right. What we're finding is that when we ask people consciously to report their unconscious emotional experiences, those don't predict. So remember, I'm a lazy person. I'm in the prediction world. And so I want to find signals in the brain that allow us to predict behavior with high accuracy and do that consistently. And so you you sort of um, highlighted this, but I'll go a little deeper earlier, which is we've created a technology that allows us to measure what the brain values in real time by applying algorithms in the cloud today as we pull from smartwatches. So all of a sudden now we have this tool that lets me assess my own emotional state, what I love doing at work, what I really don't like doing at work, um, measures my physiologic, psychological safety. Am I comfortable in this environment? Am I, am, I, am I a good teammate? Am I able to interact effectively with these people? Or are they driving me batty? And that's taking bandwidth away from me so that I can't perform at my best. Um, and you mentioned happiness earlier. So I've done a lot, of, a lot of work on happiness. And I think the correlation between happiness and productivity has been um, confused by a lot of people. It really looks like for most of the research is that productive people feel satisfied. Right. So it's not that I want you to have Taco Tuesday and, you know, whatever, uh, you know, jump around and uh, sing songs. What I really want to do is give you hard but achievable goals. You work in a team to, to meet those goals and then go, holy crap, we did some great work this week. Right. We really killed it. I feel great about my job. I feel satisfied. I have this sense of um, accomplishment, which is very important. And that comes right out of the neuroscience, by the way. So, again, we, we don't want to have 
zero stress in our lives. Stress is really useful. Moderate stress is really useful, what we call challenge stress, right? So hey, if you guys are not expending metabolic energy to engage with, with me right now, you know, you can curl up on a couch and go to sleep. Well, that's not passionate. That's not engaging. That's not fun. So I want to do the same thing for employees at businesses. Create this environment out of hard but achievable goals. Measure both as a group, but also individuals so they can learn about what they love doing. And it's a weird thing about human nature. Jason knows this. When you love something, you just do it better. That's right. And so why do we have so many people miserable at work, Paul? I mean, it seems like at some point, We've had this employee engagement data now for over 30 years in terms of it being measured, and we haven't moved the needle at all in terms of creating, by and large, healthier cultures where people are engaged, where they are getting those hits from feeling productive. What are maybe some of the cardinal sins you're still seeing or hearing about out there where we're getting a mismatch between people and the work ecosystem? Yeah, it's a great question. I think I only have a partial answer. I think it's complicated. Um, first of all, I mentioned the Gallup data. I think that data is bogus. For the reasons that, that I ever said, based on self-report, right? So what's your incentive to, to really understand that? Or do you even know, number one? Number two, we have such in the U.S., such dynamic uh, workplaces, right? Almost all employment growth is in startups and small fall businesses. And so there's all these pivoting, people moving all around. So, you know, the war for talent is over, right? Talent has won because we have record low unemployment rates. There are no more babies, Right. We've got to actually create workplaces where people can really be satisfied, have a sense of accomplishment, professional growth, personal growth. All this is really important, particularly for younger people, but for everybody. So I think part of that is we're going to see this employment move to the workplaces that have better cultures. And then the next question below that, the neuroscience question is, what does a great culture look like? Right. So, um, again, what we find in neuroscience is we want to have challenges. I want you to be stressed at work. So one thing that we've seen um, work really well is something called the tight 40, right? So at 5.30, I want that parking lot to be empty. When you're, on, when you're here, you got to be on. No more Facebook, no more shopping, whatever. So I worked at a consulting firm years ago in which like the CEO would never go home before like nine o'clock at night, ever. And everyone was just expected to stay. And I'm just like, man, I'm efficient. I get my work done. I'm ready to go. Like, I know if there's an emergency, sure, I'm happy to stay late, but, you know, get her done. And I do think the hybrid work environment um, helps facilitate that where like, I don't need to go out for lunch, drive somewhere, blah, blah, blah. Lunch is really important to, to bond with colleagues. I'm not saying don't have lunch, but you know, if I'm working at home, I can have lunch in 15 minutes and be back to work. And then 5.30, I'll go take my dog for a walk and see the sunshine, and, right? So I think there are ways to modulate that. And because talent has won this war, then we should enable and empower employees to really do their best where they are flourishing. You mentioned hybrid work, so let's go there. Let's talk about remote work too. What's your research telling us from a neuroscience perspective in terms of how's remote work working for most people in organizations? Yeah, you know, even we're looking at data before, um, you know, with the pandemic, um, people who worked remotely worked about an extra hour a day versus those who commuted uh, into the office, partially because their commute time and again, lunch time and, you know, all that. Um, so there's a big benefit to remote work. And, you know, even again, prior to the pandemic, a lot of large companies were uh, downsizing their office space, um, hot desking, right, having people move around. Um, so I think that's that's all to the good. The the uh, and, and it gives you more autonomy, more control of your schedule. That's great. The downside is we're social creatures and something magical happens when we're together. So I think the hybrid world is not going away. And I think this. Um, I won't mention the company's names, but you guys have seen the news. These uh, particularly big tech companies that are demanding that people go back in the office. Um, you can do that if something you know, very special happens. So I think a, a kind of a hybrid world where you're in the office a couple of days a week, you may be at home or working from a coffee shop or a, or a shared workspace a couple of days a week, seems to me maybe the right mix of both autonomy and those unexpected collisions in which interesting things can happen. Um, so for me, I work at home half the time and yeah, when I go to work, I'm happy to see those humans. It's like exciting, right? Like, oh gosh, here's people. I really like these people. I worked with them for years and now I get to hang out and the lunch is fun, right? So um, I, I think we're balancing those two things. Do you foresee a future where maybe with the metaverse, with technology, that we'll be able to move beyond 2D virtual into 3D and that that'll more replicate some of the actual in-person magic that happens? 
It's a great question. So the software platform I built, uh, Immersion Neuroscience, um, has a number of very large uh, clients whose name I'll just suppress um, that are had made big investments uh, in the metaverse. And so we're actually getting data on people's uh, immersion, which is their um, kind of emotional value of this experience, like how effectively are you engaging with others? So we have that data and it looks like it's quite bimodal. For some people, not always younger people, but often younger people, it's very natural, their brains adapt, it's great, particularly when you have low latency and, and uh, pretty high res uh, uh, wearables. For other people, they're finding it just doesn't work for them, right? So those meetings are, um, we look at 2D meetings versus Metaverse meetings. Often the 2D is, is actually better from a neurologic perspective. That is, I'm conveying more information, I'm picking up more of the, the value of what you're saying, that emotional value, right? That's why we have face-to-face -face meetings or this, you know, 2D face-to-face, -face, if you will. So Metaverse is not a, not a big win. VR is not going to be a win for everybody. I think it's going to be, um, again, to me, it's a measurement issue. I really want to measure and see for some aspects. Um, onboarding, uh, we've seen some great data on onboarding. Great. You can do a big chunk of that in the Metaverse because it's very rote. Um, meetings with clients so far doesn't look like it's fabulous. Uh, team meetings looks pretty good. I was at the headquarters of a of a uh, you know, Fortune 20 company uh, in New York uh, recently and uh, meeting with a very senior person. And uh, she said, uh, she, so her, she works in DC, but she came to New York to meet with me. And she goes, you know, I've been in this building so many times in the metaverse that I actually, we got the coffee. She goes, I actually know where the coffee is and we go down here, but I've almost never been physically in this building. So that's really cool, right? That, you know, you actually know how to be in a space without being in the space physically. Um, other hand, if, if I want to talk to a client and sell something, uh, man, if you'll see me in person, I'll come in person. I'm more bandwidth, so more bandwidth hitting the brain, right? You, I can touch you and you know, shake hands. Uh, we, you know, we can hang out, uh, give you a hug when we're done, whatever. You know, it's just a different experience. So, so Paul, let's let's talk about the practical aspect of this. So we're talking, we're still, we're, we're talking about what can be done right. um, as a business owner, um, you know, manager leader, have a company, I get it. Employee engagement sucks. I'm concerned that I don't have the productivity um, or quite, you know, what, however we measure quitting or quiet quitting or presenteeism, whatever whatever it is, we're, we, we get it. We got to fix the problem. Right. What's it look like? I mean, is coming to you, what's that process look like? Because you can say, okay, we can measure it here, but how? I mean, what, how, how do we do that? Right. So we have built a software platform, Neuroscience as a Service platform, that measures second by second how much people value an experience. And so valued experience, value is emotional. That emotional value means the experience will stick in my brain. It's more easily recalled later. So think of corporate training, that the awful, awful corporate training all of us have been through. You're just yawning and, you know... <laughs> We found Accenture has used our platform for years to optimize the training they offer their employees. Shorter, uh, more intensive, longer breaks, more participatory learning, right? All that in general sounds great, but when they can measure, then you can begin to optimize in real time. So I really think, um, as you've sort of highlighted, Ira, it's really about measurement now. We know the general principles of like Neuroscience 1.0, 30,000 feet, but now for this particular training, is this going well? Is this facilitator effective for these uh, learners? And that's a different question. That's a real-time question. Or I'm offering the same course with three different facilitators. Which one of those on average immerses the audience the most? What is he or she doing, right? So there's a chance to really learn a lot and begin to optimize once you have these data. Um, and the nice thing is we, yeah, you've taken you know me out of the loop. You don't want to talk to a weirdo like me, but everything's automated now. So the neuroscience technologies have advanced where they're inexpensive, they're predictive, and you can see them in real time. So that I think that's the real innovation here. And, and the book immersion, or you're nice to mention, is based on over 50,000 uh, brain observations. Because we've done this at scale, we call it distributed neuroscience, anybody can do it, they have a dashboard, they can actually see how effectively, um, you know, that whatever uh, experience they are is working. And then individuals can also learn about their own states, right? So now I have a chance to begin to manage my own work life. So again, if, if I'm correct that the war for talent has been won by talent, if, if I have talent, if I have skills, I want to deploy those skills in the way that is most valuable to me because I have a choice. And so by learning about what's most valuable to me, 
I can find my best and highest use, if you will. So just from a standpoint of just measuring heart, I mean, people have read this and you know, I've been around a while. Uh, it's like, well, you know, your heart rate goes up. That must mean either engaged or excited or fearful uh, heart rate. I mean, this, this is much beyond that. So without getting too geeky, let's talk about it. You, you've literally measured the brain and, cor and correlated some of these things. There are literally brain changes that are going on uh hormonal i mean there's changes there's there's neurotransmitter releases that right. are going on that you've been able to measure from the flip side of that that doesn't mean that oh this we have to send everybody out for a frmri uh right. <laughs> you know or a cat scan uh to do this in your workplace no um it, it's much more basic than that so if you can kind of explain um or share i want to say explain but at least share how all this happens yeah, so we, this is uh, work we started doing uh, after 9-11, funded by uh, the increase in spending to the war on terror. So the U.S. taxpayers uh, helped fund a lot of this work, which is why it makes me very happy to share it. Um, and we were tasked with identifying combinations of signals in the brain that would accurately and consistently predict what people would do after a message or an experience. So we did about 15 years of neuroscience and identified two core mechanisms that seem to be the brain's evaluation mechanism. One is I've got to be present, which is associated with the brain's binding of dopamine to the prefrontal cortex. If I'm looking over here, right, I'm not, this, the experience we're having is not going to be valuable to me. But the second is the emotional response. Is this actually creating an emotional resonance in me? And that's driven by the brain's binding of another neurochemical oxytocin. So dopamine and oxytocin have this interesting dance. They induce activity in a network in the brain that we can capture from the brain's output file, the cranial nerves. So the trick was that these cranial nerves pass through the heart. So I can use a standard heart rate wearable. Heart rate doesn't predict anything, it turns out, and nor does heart rate variability. But these very subtle effects on the rhythms of the heart that, I, that tell me about this valuation mechanism second by second is what we've captured. And I call that immersion. Like, is it, is it sufficiently valuable? Are you getting value from this experience? And that's a continuous variable. So once I have that, then I go, oh, man, I love this. And we, and we, in the extremes, we know it, right? If, if I really love a movie or if I, you know, uh, I don't know, my little daughter comes in and gives me a hug. Okay. I, I get that. But again, how, how much do I value this experience relative talking to you guys relative to my kids or my, forget my kids. They talk back to me, my dog, right? My dog's perfect. <laughs> so, but you say, how can I compare a dog to, you know, being on a podcast with you guys, right? So we need a, 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 common valuation metric and that is neural firing in the brain so i'm um, and, and just to give you I, I in reading the book i can't remember the name of the movie um when you're on the flight when yeah you, million you, dollar baby yeah million dollar baby uh, yeah you know <laughs> so, sobbing hysterically on the plane right <laughs> right and so that's an interesting experience right that that tells us about our social nature that that movie which you know is fictional i'm aware of all this um, you know, produce this emotional response to me because it, it's a father daughter story and I have daughters, right? So, you know, there's a reason why this was valuable to me, but yeah, it is very interesting. And, and then we're back to going to the office, right? I still want those office interactions. Sometimes they're, they're slightly negative, right? Someone's having a bad day. That's okay too, right? We all have bad days. And so I think our job as adults is to go, Hey, Bob, you know, you seem like you're having a tough one. Now, what can I do to help you? Right. That's what a good teammate does. And then hopefully Bob does that for me when I'm having a bad day. So, um, you know, the good and the bad run together. And I think the, the takeaway for listeners from a neuroscience perspective is we're all weirdos. Our brains are, you know, 99% percent we're, we're doing in our brains is unconscious. We don't know it. And so people are going to be weird and just be tolerant. It's okay. And we're going to be weird ourselves. So it's all right. It's fine. Paul, I'm wondering hey, about another a... practical. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ira. Okay. Uh, let's take a quick break, Jason, because we're at the bottom of the hour. I know this went like ridiculously fast. Uh, so we're going to take a quick break, one minute. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, you can go, people, you can go up and look for Paul's book. It's called Immersion, the Science of the Extraordinary and the Source of Happiness. Uh, it's on Amazon, or you can go to paulzack.com and get that. Uh, and also, if you're interested in that, the app, the Tuesday app that Paul had mentioned. Uh, you can download that for free. There's the QR code. We'll put that up again uh, during the show, um, but you can capture it there. But we're going to take a real quick break here. We'll be back in one minute. Are your employees feeling stuck and just showing up for a paycheck? 
Is your workforce working harder to get back to normal than adapting to the future? It's time to help them break their addiction to certainty and develop a growth mindset. Developed by one of the world's top-rated future of work thought leaders, AQ Plus Mindset is a powerful tool to help your employees embrace change, adapt faster, and grow on the job. Conveniently delivered to any smartphone or laptop and easy to digest 5 to 10 minute lessons. Managers can sit back and watch employee attitude shift towards growth and innovation in just 30 days. Are you ready to help your employees thrive in this ever-changing, never-normal world? Encourage them to show more grit, resilience, adaptability, and unlock their potential? The journey to a growth-filled future starts with a growth mindset. Visit aqplusmindset.com or call 484-373-4300. Hey, Paul, uh, there's the uh, QR code that I forgot to take down for the uh, to be able to download Paul's app. Um, let me turn that off somewhere if I can find it again. There it is. If not, we're getting extended time where they can download the app. A little extra immersion yeah. there for the folks. Yeah, absolutely. Paul, when I run that ad, it's like I'm, I'm thinking, it's like, hey, what's Paul thinking? And it's like, <laughs> is he engaged? You know, where does it fit? What, 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 what's being released? So did I keep the attention and, you know, did I did I create an experience? So, But we'll, we'll talk about that another day. <laughs> so, uh, Jason, before the uh, we, before we broke off, I uh, you had a question. Paul. Yeah. When Paul was discussing kind of some of the business applications of this, it just got my gears turning. I wanted to ask you, Paul, is there ability around neuroscience, the work that you're doing, where we can get better fits in terms of right person, right seat, doing the right things? And then the other question, too, is around burnout. We're hearing a lot about burnout. Will employers with this type of neuroscience research and the tools that you have, is there a burnout profile? Where you can start to see those signals early on and intervene and start doing certain types of change envir environmentally to prevent someone from getting to that point of full-blown burnout great questions jason let me take the second one first because it's uh top of mind for me yeah so we have actually published research and continue to do that um, that identify thresholds uh, that show pre-depressive symptoms so we can actually predict how much mood you have, how much energy you have with 98% accuracy using these signals that we're pulling off uh, smartwatches and again, lots of math involved. Um, so one of the strong predictors of burnout and of depression is social withdrawal. Now I'm not engaging with the humans around me. And because we can quantify neurologically the value of social interactions, once I pass these thresholds, which are published, then I say, okay, here's time for an intervention. So from a management perspective, I want to check in with this with this uh, employee and say, hey, uh, so by the way, these data are all anonymized. So this, the manager is not going to know about you as an individual. Let's, let's flip it around. So it's the employee is going to go to the manager like, hey, I've been looking at my my uh, Tuesday app and man, I'm, I'm getting burnt. Like, I don't know what's going on. So that's a discussion you want to have with your supervisor or manager. How are things at home, right? Are, are you know, are you sleeping well, right? So can we remove some work from you? Um, Boston Consulting Group has a, a program they call uh, the, the red light program. So if you work more than 60 hours, two weeks in a row, you get a little red flag. Your supervisor checks in with you like, hey, we don't think that's sustainable. So therefore, can we offload some work to you? Is it just a deadline? Is it a one-time thing? We, every once in a while, we do have to work long hours, right? So um, really, we want to... Um, have better indicators than just hours work. Maybe I'm, I'm working 60 hours a week because I'm just loving it. I have a project that I just dig and and uh, I'm single and I don't have anybody at home. And so I'm just, I'd rather work, which is fine. All right. So anyway, we have those really good indicators now. And in fact, this work is going into clinical um, um, trials now to work with psychiatric patients as well, not just healthy adults. Um, so anyway, that's really important. The second, uh, first question was on fit. Um, so the way we've associated uh, people to have kind of job fit is uh, measuring personality traits, uh, DISC or Big Five or Myers-Briggs and say, well, you have these different personality types. And if you're an accountant or a salesperson, then you should be one or the other. Um, nothing wrong with that. And, and personality traits assess, uh, sorry, predict about half of the fit from a job perspective. The other half is actually what you're doing, the people, the environment, the culture you're in, and that's a neuroscience question. So I think once we marry 
these personality trait surveys with um, real-time neuroscience, then as a smart manager who has lost the war for talent, I can begin to work with these employees and say, hey, looks like you know the accounting department's really not turning you on. Um, let's cross train you and have you spend um, uh, a couple weeks over on the sales floor and see if you know what you think about that. So uh, 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 Facebook slash Meta has a program for their coders uh, in which you can spend one day a month, you know, on the clock working with any other group that you find interesting. So like, oh, the VR guys so that um, could be really interesting. So I'll spend a day a month because they want people to move around and find where they get the most satisfaction because again, we're running out of people. Find my mute button here. Uh, so, so Paul, we, we've talked a lot about how we can measure this. Um, ultimately people are gonna say, okay, what do we do about it? So we have a better measurement. We know that, that people are burning out, they're unhappy, they're not engaged, um, all those things. What what can we do about it next? I mean, short of um, you know giving everybody a dopamine pill and spraying a little oxytocin, um, how, how do we, you know, what's next? What, what are some activities or what can managers do once they have this information uh, to be able to affect this uh, for the better? Yeah, I think there's really kind of four key key takeaway, takeaways. Um, the first is that individual employees can learn how to modulate their own work-life integration, right? So um, the Tuesday app has suggestions and it uh, prompts you to take some of those actions. Take a 10 minute walk, go get some fresh air, phone a friend. So again, because I've lost the war for talent as an employer, I'd rather pay you to use a meditation app or check in with your spouse for 10 minutes if that's gonna reset you. So we find is that you know every 45 minutes or so it's important to actually take a break on your work. Now if you're in the zone, you're in flow and you know run with it, right? Keep going. But these little breaks are actually very important. So again, whether it's 45 minutes for me or Jason needs uh, 55 minutes before he takes a break, that's individual and that's measurable. So first is begin to modulate your own work life integration. Yeah. The so second what I'm is, hearing there is with, with the managers that are thinking, yeah, but I'm paying them for those 10 minutes. Yeah, but you're, uh, you're like, to, I, I want to reduce turnover out of humans. I, I want to make sure you're satisfied, you're productive, and it's a good investment to pay you. That's a coffee break, right? That's that's going to the cooler or whatever. I'm, happening anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're being kind of funny. Okay, so the second thing is creating workplaces where that can happen. So a lot of places that you know and companies I work with have Wi-Fi, they have couches, they have a cafe. So have an opportunity for people to actually bond to each other um you're going to be friends with people you work with inevitably you spend enough time with people either love them or hate them after a while and so the people you love people you like hang out with them create that environment of psychological safety of connection uh, the third is really think of that hybrid work we've talked about this before letting people have the autonomy trusting them to um, find where they um, should be going um, and the fourth is to be proactive about moving people who are not doing so well right so um, again, if you're stealing from me or you never show up for work, I'll just fire you. I'm not going to think about it. But oftentimes for me, I've had people who try really hard, but they're just in the wrong position. So we'll we'll move them around, kind of think about how to keep them engaged and or help them get a job somewhere else. So I had a, a guy working in my lab who really wanted to work in the tech industry. I knew some people at when it was Facebook at Facebook. And I'm like, hey, you want to work at Facebook? I know some people there. I'll connect you. Now, why would I do that? Because I'm a sweet, loving human being. Maybe, but also now I've got a guy at Facebook. So if I want to do a project with Facebook, I got a guy I can call up and go, <laughs> you know, uh, hey, Bob, remember your old professor, Paul? Uh, you know, uh, I got this cool thing. I think Facebook should do it with us, right? So it's a very small world. So really connect and care for the people around you. That's the ultimate takeaway, I think. So Paul, you mentioned this earlier, Paul. I don't want to let, let this slip. Um, when we were talking about, and as, by the way, I, I, I've been talking about this war for talent, you know, wrote the, the, been talking about the perfect labor storm for 25 years. So I love the fact that it's like, Hey, the war is over. You lost, right. <laughs> I, I, but thank you for that. I'll, I'll be using that again. Uh, but, but you threw in there and, and I want to make sure that people are aware of this and, and, or just figure out why you threw it in there. You talked about the lack of babies. I mean, you talked about one of the things here, um, is, is that there's just, you know, part of the challenge is not enough babies. It seemed, seemed like that was kind of thrown in from left field. Um, other people might have might have missed that. 
Yeah, yes. what's what's the connection with this and employee, in, you know, with the engagement and, and, and our whole conversation here? Right. So as that labor market gets tighter and tighter, wages go up. And again, talent has more opportunities to move elsewhere. So in terms of these sort of four things I laid out, we really have to take it seriously. We have to take culture seriously. We have to take job fit seriously. We have to take training so that people have the sense of professional growth, can increase their salaries. So if you just saw uh, recently China restated their population uh, numbers and there's 100 million fewer Chinese than they thought originally. So China's been aging since since 2015. The U.S., if you look at the birth rates and death rates, we're going to start uh, having more deaths than births in the next couple of years, mm -hmm. uh, depending on immigration. So most of our growth comes from immigration. You guys have been to Europe. Europe's disappearing, right? There's no babies in Europe other than, again, some immigration. So if that's the world we're living in, we really got to think about nurturing uh, these people who are creating value for the organization and ensuring that they also are getting the sense of satisfaction they have a good work-life integration. There's no balance in There's no balance, right? It's work-life integration. So like we have coders work for us. They like to work all night. I don't know why coders are night people. They're always working all night. I don't care. If that's what works for you, that's your chronotype, awesome. When I wake up at six in the morning, whatever, I want to have a report or I want to talk to you before you go to sleep, you know, um, good. I, I don't really care, right? Because they're productive. They keep the ball rolling. So I think that's the world we've got to be adapting to. I know this gets into a little bit and and, and there's... I'm sure there's some people talking about this is almost like minority report stuff. So, um, you know, one of the things that I'd love to do, but obviously there's people that might be concerned where it goes and how to do it. It's, you know, I've got a class. I've got a class of 19 undergrads. Um, they're 18 to 21 or 22 years old. Um, you know, I can see what they're playing a game on the laptop. OK, right. uh, I got other a few that are engaged and a few are uh, is if if I had the data and, you know, if. if if I was the manager and that was a, t a meeting, a sales meeting or, or a team, you know, any type of a meeting, you know, or I'm an educator and I'm in a class, um, what what could I do with it? I mean, if there if, if I was getting pulses is, you know, student, uh, you know, John, um, it, I've lost them. Right. Uh, so basically you have three levers you can push on. So first of all, the, the data are anonymized. So unless John chooses to share your uh, his data with the professor with the manager um the those field individuals only see aggregated data so let's just talk about an aggregate so let's say your class has low immersion they're just not getting it they're um so the first is um how you structure the content right so um what accenture has found in the last six years using our platform is it's really 20 minute segments people cannot stay immersed for more than 20 minutes great so if that's the case, then mix up the way you teach it, right? Show a video, have a class project, uh, you know, table work, right? Move things around. Think of that sort of 20 minute blocks. Um, so that's really valuable. Um, the second is creating this space of psychological safety, right? If you're not comfortable in this space, then I can structure the content any way I want. But if it's too cold, if uh, like when I teach at night, I always say, bring food in. It's totally fine. I don't care if you guys have a chance to eat. It's fine. Eat quietly. I don't really care. I've had people bring in their babies. They can't babysitters. I'm like, bring them in. I don't care. Right? It's fine. I'd rather have you be here and be part of that discussion because it's valuable not only for that student, but for everybody else. So create a, a space of psychological safety, which opens up bandwidth to be immersed. The third is, Ira, how you deliver it. I have no doubt, having spoken to you now a couple of times, that you deliver with energy. So the cool thing about neurologic immersion is it, contagious. Right? If you're excited about this topic, that flows into the students, that flows into your, your uh, team levels. So during uh, the pandemic, uh, a very large technology company that you could search their name, uh, we're using our technology to measure their meetings, which all went remote. This company has 86,000 meetings a year. So they started measuring these. And what we found was that the leader had a huge effect on the immersion and psychological safety of these remote team members, right? These are one hour team meetings. And um, we saw a lot of leaders who uh, sustained immersion for an hour. They engaged with the, the team. They had good discussions. And other team leaders, they just, it was like a downward trend. You know, the, the more they, they talked, the longer the meeting went, the less engaged those individuals were neurologically. So, I'm, again, I haven't seen video of these, but I'm imagining this person stressed out. They're talking really fast, like, oh, my God, we're missing deadlines. Blah. Okay, you're great. Moderate stress, good, but high stress, not good. That's not good for performance. So that's a training issue, right? So 
for that leader, they need to have a little more training of like, hey, you want to push people, you want to, you know, give them challenges and and uh, mentor them to reach those challenges. But if you are so stressed out that your team is just shut down, that's not good either. So again, that's where measurement comes into me. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that so much. And I, I keep going back to one of the things that the, I've been remote for 20 years, but the, one of the things that 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 I saw have, have, having had the ability to participate in um, uh, you know, a lot of Zoom meetings uh, with with senior leaders that I might not have had the chance before. You know, they're working out of their house. And prior to February of 2020, if your dog was barking or if the you know a grandchild or a child ran into the room, um, you know, in fact, there was that video yeah. that was that almost a meme circulating right. around that there was a, a an executive on a call and the child ran in and then. I don't know, was the, the maid or the mother, you know, came in to kind of rustle them out. And, and it was like, how embarrassing was that? And then all of a sudden that became the norm. And right. and so, you know, tracing this back to uh, leaders becoming uh, or everybody becoming much more vulnerable, much more authentic, much more transparent. Uh, and, you know, I said this soon as people started to go back to work. I hope that's the one thing that wasn't lost. Uh, right. And and now what you're doing is you're verifying that you're, you're verifying that that actually has an impact. So whether you, if, if you're a, if you're a leader, uh, you're you can be a manager, you can be anybody, you can be a committee chair. You're you're, you're running a meeting on Zoom. Um, you can have high levels of engagement mm -hmm. of, of sure. emerging. Yeah, it's, it, it's, I it's totally agree. Ability. Vulnerability is actually very attractive. So when people are competent, but they're also vulnerable, they're open emotionally. People want to actually perform better for them, right? So it's really mm -hmm. asking rather than demanding, right? So if if I've lost a war for talent, then everyone who works for me is essentially a volunteer. I'm still paying them, but they're volunteering to work for me and not for somebody else. And so I should treat them that way. And when I'm like, hey, you guys, I really need help on this project. You know, Jason, do you have time? Can you can you give me like five hours a week for the next couple of weeks? Because man, we got to get this thing done, and we're we're short on people, and you're an expert. And like, oh, so that's a different story than. Yeah, God damn it, Jason, you lazy bastard. You got, you know, that's not appropriate ever. Um, <laughs> you know, and like yelling at people, never appropriate, right? Let's just be clear on that. That's not, uh, it's a good short term motivator, but people will quit. Um, I've had the yelling bosses, not you, Ira, but uh, I've had some people, I'm like, okay, what time can I get out of here and look for a new job? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Hey, hey, Paul, uh, we, I can go on for, for forever with you and, and really dig deep. And some, I, I hope we have an opportunity because there's so many. I, I, I was taking some notes in the book. There are just some questions. It's like, hey, if I can meet with Paul, here's what I'd ask. And it's, and so I highly recommend uh, everybody go up and, and getting the book and I'll post this. But um, we, we sort of start to wrap up the show with this question. Uh, and I know you provided some and we might have missed one or two of those, but maybe something else came up. If there was a question that we didn't ask you that we should have, what would it have been? I think that link to happiness. And so um, because we have these measurement tools that allow us to curate our lives for better happiness, a lot of that happens at work. And so we shouldn't think of this work life conflict. Really, it's for many of us, it's an integration. And I get a lot of satisfaction from solving problems at work. And so I really think about from a management perspective about creating this opportunity for happiness, for life satisfaction. And um, and once you have a measurement tool, you can do that more efficiently. Thank you. Thanks awesome. for the question and thanks for answering that. <laughs> Absolutely. Paul, we're going to move into our uh, next segment here, which is a lightning round. This one's right. where we're going to ask you just a few questions to get to know you a little bit better on a personal level and help our audience do the same. So you went there earlier in the show. You said that you were the neuroscience doctor on The Bachelor so we got to start with this one. Most surprising thing that you saw on The Bachelor? Um, honestly, how earnest The Bachelor was and how um, aggressive the females were who were trying to get him. <laughs> I was on with Ben Higgins, who's a really, I spent a whole, like 12 hours with him, extremely nice guy. So um, even though it seems very contrived and it is, it's edited and all that. Um, really, there are people who are quite nice on on the film, and it, it, a lot of the women, by the way, were super nice as well. So I shouldn't say they're all, but you know, they're competing, so it's a different it's a different ball game. I mean, the Bachelor's on his own, so it, anyway, that was surprising to me. That had to be quite the immersion activity to try and measure uh, on the show. So thank you for for sharing that piece. Up up next, next question: How about if there's one person in the history of the world that you could meet, who would it be? 
You know, that's a great question. Uh, probably depends on the the mood. Um, I'm, I'm a super big fan of the founders of our nation. Uh, George Washington would be amazing, right? He could have been king and didn't. He, he, you know, didn't even really want to be president and over his objections served for two terms and then walked away and left Washington. Like amazing human beings. So anyway, I'd say George Washington would be great. I love that. And I, that's the first time we've gotten a founding father as, as someone of the United the States. Had, I think it's the first time we had a president. That's true. Yeah, we haven't had any presidents <laughs> yet. So that's really cool, Paul. Um, how about this one? Uh, favorite musician or music group? You know, I'm a sort of world music eclectic uh, person. Um, oh, Peter Gabriel, I think is amazing. Nice. Yeah. Just saw him last year. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's right. I remember that. And then how about this one for the last one? Um, what would be a hidden talent or skill that people may not think about when they think of Paul Zach? You know, I'm so out there. You probably know everything about me. Hidden talent or skill. Um, I'm really a, a, the worst slapstick comedian ever. Uh, so I love to uh, make people laugh by doing the stupidest, stupidest thing. So I may seem very, um, whatever, forthright and educated, but I'm actually the stupidest, you know, on the level of the Three Stooges <laughs> level stupidity. So um, I love to make people laugh. Well, now you've piqued all of our curiosities. Are there any TikTok or YouTube videos out there that we can look at? Oh, up? no, all in private. Although all I in private, okay. Once at the uh, Aspen Ideas Festival and they said, uh, for the first time, we're going to try an experiment, which is we'll give you five minutes at a comedy club for the first 12 people. And, you know, I thought about that for about 20 seconds. I'm like, I I'll do that. So I, I, there is a video of me doing a five minute bit at a comedy club, which seemed to go well. So uh, but I'll never do it again. It was too hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Paul, thank you for doing our lightning round. I'm going to send it back over to Iris. who will get ready to wrap up here. Yeah, I, I just learned uh, the other day that somewhere in my grandmother's bloodline, I am related to one of the three stooges. So I don't know which one. Whoa, I don't, which I don't even one. know. I don't even know how. So I, I Ira, this is big news. This is big <laughs> I'm gonna, news. I'm gonna rub your head when I see you, Ira. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. And and then I guess it's um which generation are we talking to? Because I've got three stooges. What's that? <laughs> So, it's us Paul, today. Uh, yeah, I, Paul, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, thanks so much. Let me uh, go and grab your book again, uh, because I do encourage everyone, whether you listen, whether you read, um, you know, you, whether you want to kind of turn the pages, uh, go out and get immersion. Uh, he'll make a lot of more sense of what we we're talking about today. Uh, dig a little for those of you who want to dig a little deeper into the science. It's there, but very, very understandable. Uh, and uh, it's actually uh, it's a great narration. You can it's a, it's an easy book to listen to. And one more time, we want to go back. And uh, if you want to download Paul's uh, Tuesday app, um, so you don't want any more manic Mondays, go to Tuesday. Uh, you can download it right here. We'll also put the link in the uh, notes uh, for those who are listening and not watching. Perfect. And the little typo on the website is Paul J for Joseph Zach. So Paul J. Oh, okay. Zach, right. I uh, apologize coming. about that. Yep. No worries. Uh, we'll get that corrected. And um, and you can also go to get immersion uh, to, to your website. Yes. Right? Good. Paul, appreciate it very much um, for taking the time out. We'll be keeping uh, tabs on you of everything that's going on. Uh, congratulations. Uh, and, and thank you for all the work you're doing. That's, this is fa it's fascinating. What a pleasure to be on. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Ira, it could have gone on and on. I mean, that was absolutely wow. talk about yeah. immersive. Um, could have just gone on and on in terms of how how this whole world of how we think about people and work and how we're able to get into these these scientific details now blew my mind. And I think for me, that was my biggest takeaway listening to Paul today was we're quickly evolving out of this whole phase of self-report on surveys as to how things are going. And we're moving into this new era of wearables, of actual data, of getting neurological and physiological signals of how we're doing, and then being able to intervene and say, hey, it's time for a break, or it's time to do 
fill in the blank intervention. That was one of my big takeaways today. How about you? Yeah, I, I and, you, and you mentioned data. I think the collection, you know, we, we people have been collecting data. We've been talking about people analytics. You know, I was doing a series of some uh, workshops in, in just a few years ago on uh, people analytics. Uh, but unfortunately, the data we're collecting may not be accurate and predictable. And, and so I, I mean, I, I'm so excited about what the next uh, few years are going to bring uh, with, you know, for, with Paul's doing and what uh, just the whole uh, field of neuroscience is going to do. It's going to be transformative of, um, you know, e even though we had data, we were still somewhat guessing and the and data was unreliable. So we can really have an impact on, on people's lives, not only making them more productive at work, but uh, really dealing with what we've been talking about the last few weeks is, uh, you know, mental health and employee well-being and, you know, which is ultimately just, it, it just rolls downhill. Um, the other big takeaway, and I'll be sure to be repeating this over and over again, that the, that we're not in a war for talent. The, the war is over. Uh, so I, I love that. And uh, I think that's so appropriate and, and, and it is so fitting. And uh, so I, I, I appreciate that as well. And, uh, you know, uh, again, it's I, I go through every day um, and looking at situations is um, it's almost made, I want to say made me paranoid, but maybe super aware. Um, of, you know, are, are they engaged? I wish I knew I can measure it now. I can measure it now and, and, and how you can do that and say, hey, show me your watch, <laughs> you know, or, <laughs> am I, you know, right. or, or vice versa is I can just show them my watch and say, not very engaged, <laughs> you know, at all. you're losing me. So, uh, but I appreciate it. So again, we want to th uh, thank Paul Zach. I'm going to just put this up one more time for him. I can find it. There's the book, Immersion. I highly recommend going up to Paul, Paul Jzak, uh, com, Paul Jzak com, uh, or you can go up to Amazon and uh, you know, get the book. Uh, you can also listen to our podcast. And as Paul said, he's all over the place. There's lots of good videos, lots of good interviews that he's had. And uh, uh, you know, again, good person to know. Absolutely. So thank you to our guest, Paul, Zach, well, because of him and guests like him. That's why our podcast is in the top 100 in business management category. And we're top 1% in the world in total popularity. So thank you to our guest, Paul, today um, for pushing the, the needle and moving it forward uh, when it comes to the future of work and making a better future of work for all. If you haven't liked or subscribed to the podcast, please do so. YouTube, Apple, Spotify, whatever your favorite platform is uh, for listening to your favorite podcast. Please subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And until next time, I'm Jason Cochran signing off. And thank you, everyone, for being part of Googleization Nation. Thank you for putting us in the top 100 of leadership and management podcasts. I'm Ira Wolf. Until next week, don't let the shift hit your plans. Thanks for watching Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization. Be sure to listen to the podcast and follow us on YouTube. This show was produced and edited by Hilton Productions.